Come on, is it a good day to be in the house of the Lord? I love it. I love it. So I'm going to get into this. Uh, this is a lot. I have a lot. So I need y'all to listen fast. Can we do that this morning? <laughs> How much I always go too long. So today, y'all just need to listen fast, lock in. Does anybody else watch YouTube videos at like time and a half? Oh, yeah. See, yeah, yeah. Or podcasts. My, yeah, it's like, man, my mind can process faster than that. So listen fast today, and we're going to get through all of it. Amen? Amen. Well, last time, I think it was like eight or nine months ago, uh, I shared uh, a message called It Starts in the Heavenlies. It starts in the heavenlies, and I think I'm just going to kind of pick it up uh, from there. So if you haven't listened to that, you can go to Facebook at some other time. Not right now, please. You can go to Facebook at some other time and look it up. It's called It Starts in the Heavenlies, and it's talking about spiritual warfare, and we taught out of Daniel 10 and what happens when you actually pray and heaven responds and a real enemy tries to stop what heaven is trying to do for you. And so we're going to pick up right from there. Let's pray. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you that we know the plans that you have for us. And we know that there is a real adversary that doesn't want to see those plans come to pass. And so, Father, right now we just receive your finished work. We ask that our hearts and our minds would be open to receive what you have. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are speaking through me and to me as we talk about what it means to operate from the heavenlies, to operate from a spiritual place and have things be manifested in the natural. God, we thank you for this time and we rejoice in advance for the testimonies that will come from this time this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, so guys, many of us have been ripped off. And some of y'all are thinking about like old business deals and stuff. I'm not talking about that. Many of us have been ripped off. Many of us have unclaimed things that are sitting in the heavenlies right now. There are unclaimed things that are sitting in the heavenlies right now. And the enemy does what? Let's jump into the scripture right quick. In John 10, verse 10, a lot of you already know it. Any Bible scholars in here? Come on. Well, I mean, you kind of did the notes. <laughs> Come on, the enemy. John 10, I think we have it. You could put it up. I think I might be lying. Come on, I'll do it like Bible school class. Y'all ready? Let's all read this together because that way I know y'all are paying attention. Here we go. Let's read it. Let's read it. I can't see it. The thief. Jeez. You're doing great. Keep going. People always get robotic when they read together. It's funny. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. In John 10, that's the only thing he ever comes to do. His only task, his only goal, his only mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so when we say that there are unclaimed things in the heavenlies, that means that the enemy has successfully, in some form or fashion, stolen, killed, or destroyed something that was meant for you from God. And so how do we get it back from that place? Quick review, when we talked about Daniel 10 last time, you see Daniel, the word says that he prayed, and the day that he prayed, God heard his prayer, God responded, God sent an answer, and then it says that the prince of Persia, a demonic force, intercepted the angel that God sent for Daniel. And so Daniel, in fasting for 21 days, this is where we get the 21-day fast from, not because God said, hey, do this for 21 days. It was just because that's how long it took. And so he's fasting 21 days. Prince of Persia intercepts the angel God sent to him. Michael, in heaven, goes to God, says, hey, God, we got a problem. The angel got intercepted. God said, what you mean the angel got intercepted? Michael said, we got to go help him out. God said, go ahead then. So Michael goes, has this cosmic battle with this demonic force, releases the angel, and then the angel goes to Daniel and says, huh, I can imagine him getting there tired, busted, like, hey, man. I'm sorry, I was on my way, and I got jumped. And not only did they jump me, they held me captive and hostage for, this is in the Bible, read it yourself, Daniel 10. They held, this is my translation, though. They held me captive for 21 days. Can you imagine what captivity of an angel for 21 days even looks like? I can't. I'm trying. I love superhero stuff, so I'm like, man, I need Marvel to make a movie out of that. 
but make it Christian. <laughs> and so for 21 days, and then he's released, and then the angel tells Daniel, on the first day you prayed, I heard you. God heard you, and he answered you, and he sent an answer. But I got held up. But because you pressed in, you fasted, and you prayed, God sent in the big guns and Michael and said, hey, Michael, go handle that. Look at Daniel. He's got standing. Look at him. He's still pressing in. Where in the world is that angel we sent? Said, I don't know, God. His, his, uh, his apple tracker just shut off right around Persia. The eyes of that. And so goes and get him, and we established the fact on that last message that everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is spiritual and invisible. We'll say it one more time. Everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is spiritual and invisible. You cannot correct something in your life if you do it out of order. So when you reverse engineer, who's a, people reverse engineer stuff? When you reverse engineer something, if you trace it back as far as you can, it will be in the heavenlies first. It'll always be in the heavenlies first in some form or fashion in your life and in the things to do around. And so we established last time also in Ephesians 6, 12, Bible scholars, what does that say? Praise God, we're going to do a Bible back to the basics, Pastor Tony. Ephesians 6, 12. Come on, we fight not against, I won't make y'all read it, I won't make y'all read it, but we fight not against flesh and blood, but of principalities. We fight not against flesh and blood, and we hear it a lot, but how often in our lives do we actually reflect on what it means to not fight against flesh and blood? Because now we're trying to give a, a cultural, an economical, a, a, a political analysis of things that are happening when we can reverse engineer something and figure out that it started in the heavenlies. It started in the heavenlies. Obviously, we know this is a crazy year. <laughs> there are crazy things happening nationally that we're going to hear about and read about. And all I ask is that if you're going to mention things, let where you start be in the heavenlies. If you haven't prayed and fasted about it, you don't care about it that much. That's just, it is what it is. If you haven't prayed and fasted about it, you do not care about it that much. Because if God gave us the blueprint of how to move the heavenlies, and we learned last time that every spiritual blessing is found in the heavenlies, and Jesus is seated in the heavenlies, and God has seated us next to Jesus in the heavenlies, then why would I do anything else and expect different results? So uh, before those Facebook posts go out, and those tweets and those messages come out, come October and November, if I see it, I'm going to DM you. I'm going to say, man, how did your fast go about this? Because I know you were travailing in the spirit on behalf of this thing. Amen. Convict us, Holy Spirit. We're ready. <laughs> and so Daniel 10, we see he prayed and the prayers were answered, and he found himself in a cosmic conflict that affected the natural. And the enemy was seeking to not give him what God had for him. When you petition for something in the natural, you are inserting yourself in a cosmic conflict, and you need to know how to operate the heavenlies. Do you know how the heavenlies work? Do you know how God's designed and ordered things so that when you bring your petition for him, you can actually move heaven? Or have you found yourself asking, praying, and petitioning for things without seeing results and just kind of moved on? When you petition for something, you have inserted yourself into a cosmic conflict. How do we resolve it? The title of this message, I actually forgot what it was. What's the title of this message? Put that slide up. King's Court. <laughs> I really did forget for a second. I knew what it was about. I knew it was about. I just forgot what I called it. The title is King's Court, Operating from Heaven's Courtroom. Operating from Heaven's Courtroom. 
And so to kind of establish this, I'm actually going to go back to Daniel, but we're going to go a few steps, a few chapters or so before. And I want to read this and, and kind of unpack this a little bit. So we're going to be in Daniel 7 to understand this concept a little better. So in Daniel 7, in verse 9, in verse 9, it says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Can we just stop? That's crazy. Like these pictures of what the throne room of God is. His wheels were burning fire. Verse 10, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And 10,000 times 10,000, or 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. We have a scene here. It's a throne room, but it's also a courtroom. You have a king sitting on a throne and you have a judge sitting on a bench and they're the same person. There's over a hundred million people present, a thousand times a thousand and 10,000 times 10,000 were watching. So just picture this, there's a throne, fiery, Jesus sitting there, a hundred million people is a lot of people, y'all. And he's setting this up, we're in a courtroom and it's not enough to understand the rule of God if you don't know how the court of God operates. So there's a king and there's a judge. And I don't know about y'all, but when I grew up, um, any Judge Judy fans here? <laughs> Come on, well, my family grew up in a different part of the hood, so we watched Judge Mathis. But <laughs> if you know, they both didn't play, though. One thing you knew about Judge Judy, if somebody got to yapping at her, it was almost like you hope, it's like when you watch hockey and you kind of hope somebody fights. When you're watching Judge Judy, you hope somebody talks back. Cause you just wait and you're like, ooh, she finna put them in their place. Boy. And you start cheering like you're a part of the jury or something. And so in those moments, a judge is there to hopefully give a righteous and just ruling. And what the judge decides can change your life drastically for good or for bad. Now, we ain't gonna get nobody business, but some of y'all in here have been to court. <laughs> I've been to court. I ain't gonna say that. I've been to court. Hallelujah. You redeemed me from the blood of the Lamb. Some of us have been to court. Some of us have taken people to court. Some of us have been taken to court, whether it's by the city <laughs> or, or by a person. And it's usually not good implications. But we know that what the judge rules can change everything. It can change everything. But in court, you have opposing sides. You have somebody that's an accuser. Is there like an actual lawyer in this room? I hope not, because I ain't trying to butcher these terms. Praise God, so y'all ain't even gonna know. So in this court, you got two people. You got an opposing side, and then I watch suits sometimes though. So you got a plaintiff and a defendant and a prosecutor, an accuser, if you would. And so in Daniel 7, it said the court was seated and the books were open. If you jump down to Daniel 7, verse 25, it says he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Guys, that's us. We the saints. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and a half time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. Verse 27. 
And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Now, this verse in Daniel 7 is a future picture of the Antichrist that will seek to rule, but he will be brought to court and the sovereignty and dominion of God will override and overrule him. So in this, this verse is talking about an end times, which if you've gone here at any length of time, we believe we're in that. We're experiencing things that scripture says. But there's a verse in 1 John, in 1 John 4, that says that there's antichrists that have already come and that are already at play even now. And so I want to read this verse. It says in 1 John 4, verse 3, it says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. You heard it was coming. So you're talking the actual Antichrist, the figure of the being, the actual biblical person. And then the spirit of the Antichrist, which in 1 John is described, every spirit that doesn't confess Jesus. We did a, a podcast episode about new age things and um, it was cool. Tracy got to share some of her testimony and how God brought her out of that. And I feel like 1 John 4 is essentially the trump card to all things. Any spirit that doesn't confess Jesus is an antichrist spirit. Period. Period. There's no more further investigation or digging that needs to be done. Any spirit that doesn't confess Jesus is an antichrist spirit. And so when I find myself in a moment where I'm trying to receive something from anything else that doesn't confess Jesus, I'm potentially and likely entertaining an antichrist spirit. Some of y'all are canceling memberships. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's something to think about. First John 4, it's, the, it's, just, it's just the trump card. There isn't anything that Jesus can't give me that something else can. Right? Jesus said, I have created a one-stop shop for you. And Paul talks and says that the mysteries of God, the deep and mysterious things of God, God has sent his spirit to navigate for us and then communicate those things with us. It's like when you're talking about the garden, why didn't God want them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Satan lied and said, well, it's because God doesn't want you to be like him. No, a knowledge of good isn't quote unquote bad. Obviously, the evil can be bad. There's argument there. But it's because it lessens our dependency on him. It lessens our dependency on him. He wanted to be the one to walk in the garden with them and talk about all the mysteries. Adam, ask me any questions you got. You can ask me about the cosmos. You can ask me about the stars and the planets. You can ask me about those things. Navigate those things with me, not apart from me. Because apart from me, they may not confess Jesus and it'll be a spirit of the Antichrist. So we've got a king sitting on a throne, a judge sitting on a bench, and they're the same person. And the books were open. See, the issue here was that there's a complainant. I did a dictionary check on that word because it sounded funny. I was like, complainant? I heard of a plaintiff. What's a complainant? It's a real word, and there's no lawyers here, so if it's not, we're going to rock with it. So there's a complainant. There's an accuser that accuses constantly. There's an accuser that the Bible says accuses day and night. There's an accuser that's goal is to take you before court to God and say, hey, you can't actually give him those things because they've done X, Y, Z. They're accusing you day and night. In Revelations 12, we see the word kind of given this history of Satan, kind of given this history of the enemy, and specifically 
in verse 10 in Revelations 12, it says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ uh, and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. This is the enemy who accuses them day and night before God. He accuses you day and night before the judge and says, wait, 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 wait. Daniel can't receive that because X, Y, Z. This happened. Good thing Daniel decided to show up to court in his prayer and in his fasting and said, no, God sent his son and he paid for that. I got a pardon for all of that stuff. See, even the enemy knows the legal order in which he has to accuse you. And he's hoping that you don't know your rights legally so that you can have unclaimed things in the heavenly just waiting and then not have the awareness or the wherewithal to be like, maybe I should fast a little bit. Maybe I should press in a little bit more. And God is like, I answered that on day one. Where is it? Is it in Persia? Is it somewhere else? Where is that thing? And so the legal term accuser is a core term. It's, it's, it's a core thing. We see it all throughout scripture. And he's accused several people in scripture. This, there's so many pictures of this. He accused Peter. Even Jesus was like, man, Satan has, has, has come out and has seek to sift you like wheat. He's accusing him. We see this happen to Job. He's accusing him. We see this happen to Joshua, the high priest. He's accusing him. And so even in that, I want to just look at that real quick, a picture, another picture of this court setting, if you would, where Satan has drawn up an accusation against somebody that God has called to do something for the larger picture and benefit of his kingdom. And Satan is trying to thwart that assignment. And so even in Zechariah chapter three, you have Joshua, the high priest, and Joshua, he was the first high priest in the, at the reconstruction of the Jewish temple after the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. And so he was tasked to not only rebuild a temple, but to restore Jerusalem as the first high priest since that. And in Zechariah 3, it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So even we'll read the rest, but I want to stop right there. It says he's standing before the angel of the Lord. And it doesn't say an angel of the Lord. It says the angel of the Lord. And so a lot of people believe, and I believe that this is the pre-incarnate Jesus. It is the angel of the Lord. Is standing there before God. And it says Satan is standing at his right hand, accusing him, accusing Joshua. And so here you have a judge, you have Joshua the plaintiff, and you have the accuser who is accusing him. In verse 2, it says, and the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And so when it says that he's standing there with filthy garments, it's not just that he was naturally and physically dirty. He was standing there in a sense that had iniquities, he had things that were wrong with him. And Satan said, I'm taking Joshua to court. Look at all of these iniquities. He's standing there in filthy garments. He isn't fit to be the next high priest. He's not you. Legally, I'm coming to you and saying, hey, he's doing all of these things. He's not going to be the one to bring forth God's plan and restore in Jerusalem. And Joshua, it doesn't say, but what I think happened... <laughs> Joshua was probably like, I, 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 but I, because it was true. It says he was, in fact, standing there with filthy garments. And I believe that before Joshua could even say anything, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus was like, wait a minute. 
remove the filthy garments from him. And it says he said to those standing before him. So not only do you have the accuser, you have a plaintiff, you have a judge, you have somebody bringing something against Joshua. There's people, there's heavenly beings that are on looking. It says the angel of the Lord said to those that were standing for him. I'm going to just say this is the jury right here. Like, oh, hey, man, Satan, he got a point. He got a case against Joshua. And they kind of look at God, look at Jesus. What do we do? Joshua's nervous. What's about to happen right now? The angel of the Lord, I believe the pre-incarnate Jesus says, no, 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 no. Even though my time has yet come, hey, Jerry, remove those filthy garments from him. And then he looked at Joshua and he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. See, Joshua's verdict was rendered in that capacity because of his proximity to him. And later in this chapter, you see, for the sake of time, we won't go there, but you see the Lord instructs Zechariah to put a crown on Joshua's head to signify that not only is he now the high priest, he put a crown for it to be a foreshadowing of Jesus coming and saying, one is coming that's going to take away your iniquities and he's going to be the high priest and he's going to be the king. He's going to be the king of the throne room and the judge of the courtroom. Are you in proximity enough to get a ruling rendered in your favor when you are guilty? Are you in proximity enough to get a ruling in your favor when you are guilty? See, the, the, the accuser says accuses day and night, and it's accusing different things in our lives. The enemy has set up different demonic forces and has given them assignments. You see the prince of Persia. He was the prince of a region, a demonic force at the end. He was like, hey, I'm just going to hang out here. And this is your plan to come against what God has for this space. There's demonic forces that have been assigned to this region, to families, to homes, to people. And the enemy's like, hey, I need you to come, come and accuse them day and night because this is what God has for them. And we're just going to pray that they don't know what their rights are to come and accuse them. So God operates his kingdom legally. He legally operates his kingdom. And the goal of that is to institute the plan and the purpose that he has for you through that. And Satan's goal is to take you to court and to appeal to the judge and give reasons as to why you can't walk in what God has ultimately called you to walk in. And so back to Daniel chapter seven, we're in a courtroom, says the judge was seated and the court was seated and the books were open. The books were open. What books were open? What books are y'all looking at? This ain't like the Lamb's book of life. What book is it? So in Psalm 139, I believe David tells us what these books are. Psalm 139, a familiar scripture. David is lamenting per usual. And he's saying how awesome God is. You know the hairs on my head. You know all of these things about me, Lord. And we know at the end of that, he says, search my heart and see if there's any way in me that's not of you. And then lead me to life everlasting. But in Psalm 139 and verse 16 and 17, David says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, oh God. How precious. We all have a book that where God saw our unformed body, had a plan and a purpose and will for your life. And scripture says he wrote it all down in a book. Now, sometimes people prophesy and, and <laughs> sometimes they miss. When it's true pro prophecy and not just prophecy of God's sovereign will of what he wants to do overall in the kingdom of God, but when it's prophecy for you personally and there is prophecy that's being brought forth and it's true prophecy and it's from God, prophecy is simply God giving somebody insight on your book and telling you about it. 
Now, whether that happens, it's merely just an opportunity to partner with what God has for you. It's not a guarantee that that thing is going to happen. It is an opportunity to partner with the perfect will of God concerning your life. You have a book. Every day of your life has been ordained and written out in this book before you ever were conceived. And so I'm reading this, and my question to myself and to you guys is, when was the last time you considered your book? Or did you even know you had a book? Like, wouldn't you want to pray prayers and say, God, on this day, June 2nd, 2024, Holy Spirit, show me what God writ written for me in my book today. If your word says that there's mercy, your mercies are new every single day and that I ought not worry about tomorrow, that today has enough worries for itself, then I just want to receive whatever you wrote down in your book for me. What's in my book? What's in your book? I'm trying to get into the habit every single day that I'm waking up and I'm like, God, your word says apart from you, I can do nothing. I believe that apart from you, there's nothing really worth doing. And so what does your book have written down today? I want to do that. I want to do that. And so the court was seated and the books were open and the enemy is accusing and saying, hey, 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 they can't have that. And God's like, well, I wrote down that they can. And the enemy's sitting there hoping that you don't show up. And hoping that you give in and give up and just accept the accusation that's been brought against you because the enemy went to the judge legally and said, they can't have that. And God's like, yes, they can. The enemy was like, great. Well, hopefully they show up to claim it. Will they show up to the courtroom to claim the thing that you've written down in their book? The court was seated and the books were open. Now in Hebrews 10... Verse 5 through 7, this is Jesus speaking. It says, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Jesus had a book too. Scripture tells us that Jesus said, I can't do anything my father doesn't do. I can't do, I can't say anything that my father doesn't say. This scripture said, Jesus is talking and says, you have prepared a body for me. Can you imagine Jesus and all of his deity in heaven, in the heavenly realm, saying like, you've prepared a body for me, knowing that he was about to have to humble himself step out of eternity and into time and be bound by the things and the natural things of this world and dimensions of this world, knowingly like, God, you prepared a body for me. Which is kind of cool to think about. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, man, can you make that body like 6'4", maybe 6'5"? You prepared a body for me. You don't take pleasure in any of those sacrifices. And all the days of my life are also written in a book. Jesus said, I'm not saying anything my father doesn't say. I'm not doing anything, one single thing that's not written in my book while I'm there. So that when you don't, you get mercy and grace for that. Jesus did everything according to his book so that we wouldn't be held accountable when we don't do everything according to our book. The court was seated and the books were open. Are we going to show up? Are we going to show up? The goal of Satan is to take away the purpose that God ultimately has for you. And he tries to do that legally by bringing accusations against you day and night. And he's hoping that you're not even aware of the unclaimed things that are hanging in the heavenlies. Could you potentially have an angel right now that's trying to answer a prayer that got caught up from something? And we know that obviously the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we were able to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirits have been trying to get your attention, saying, yo, we got a court date, and you missing it. I don't want to ask. I don't know how many people in here may have missed a court date before. 
but it usually gets worse after that. There's usually some repercussions for missing a court date. But I remember having a speeding ticket one time. I said, I bet 10 bucks, take a little defensive driving. I got to get on some like little court, little court Zoom call thing. I forgot. It was before we got married, babe. I mean, just, just let you know. It was before, it was before. But I forgot. And a $60 ticket turned into a $590 ticket because I missed a court date. So could a small bump in the purpose and plan God has for your life turn into a massive mountain to navigate around because you missed your court date? Are you aware that the enemy is accusing you day and night? Scripture says that his mercies for us are new every morning. He didn't say that for no reason. They're new because we need them. So is there a day that goes by where you don't count the mercy of God that you've received because you've somehow believed that you can manage the day on your own? And even if something in the natural doesn't actually go bad, there's unclaimed things in the heavenlies that are waiting for you. There's moments, last time I spoke, I talked about prayer and fasting and how God, for the first time a couple years ago, was like, gee, you about to do a 40-day fast. And I said, God, I don't know if that's in my book. I don't know if that's in my book. That don't sound like something I would do. But then at the same time, I'm in praying. I'm, I'm having my quiet time at night. I'm like, God, what am I supposed to do with my life? What's the next season of my life? Am I doing what you call me to do? Is this the job I'm supposed to be doing? Is this really it? Is there a plan and a purpose greater than what I'm doing right now? And he's like, yeah, I wrote it in your book. But you're too busy and occupied with a ton of things in this natural world that you haven't shown up, so I could tell you. Satan's accusing you right now. And here he is listing things, listing iniquities. He can't experience that because of this, because of that, because of this. And the kicker is they're all true. But you didn't understand how good of a lawyer you had where the Holy Spirit says that he's your advocate. That's a legal term as well. He is your advocate. You ever watch those? I used to watch. Uh, <laughs> what's one of those? Suits is also good. I like suits. But uh, Matlock. I used to watch some Matlock. Well, my dad used to watch it. I just had to watch it. But ended up enjoying it. You ever watch any of these lawyer shows, and then you see a case, and you like, Man, that man is going to jail. <laughs> he guilty, guilty, times 10. And all of a sudden, you see Matt Logway come in. You see Harvey Specter come in. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know he guilty, but that lawyer is a bad man. And if there's anybody that could get him off the hook, it's him. If there's anybody that can make that guilty man walk free, it's him. If there is anybody that can get us off the hook, our advocate, the Holy Spirit, acts as our lawyer as well. And when the enemy comes and makes accusations against you day and night, by proximity with the Father, I can say, God, what's in my book? Even when Satan's like looking over his shoulder like, no, 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 no. He did X, Y, Z. I said, God, he's right. I did. But I come with you in a repentant heart. And I'm here and I'm saying, God, your will be done. Satan's trying to erase the pages out of your book and say, you can't have those for whatever reason. He did the same with Jesus. He tried to erase the pages out of Jesus's book at birth, killing thousands of babies to even start, stop his book from even coming to be. In the wilderness, offering him all kinds of things, offering him dominion that was natural and not even authoritative to say, man, how about you forfeit what God's written in your book? Maybe this book is better. And Jesus answered him, it is written. It is written. When Satan comes and makes accusations against you and tries to erase the pages of your book, what is your response? What is your response? We know God. 
As a father, we know God as a friend. We need to know God as a judge. And we've gone to God and we've been taught to go to God relationally, which is great, which is perfect, which is amazing. God is our father. He loves us. He moves in compassion. But God is also that guy. And we don't need to just go to him relationally. We need to go to him legally. We need to go to him legally. And obviously this isn't allowed on a, in an earthly court with earthly laws, but in heavenly laws, can you imagine on earth if you were going to court for something drastic and you like, man, I'm facing 20 to life. And you walk in and the judge is your dad and the lawyer is your best friend who's never lost a case before. You tell me your demeanor wouldn't be a little different. Read them charges. I don't care. What else is on that list? Read. Okay, that one was a little bad. Read the rest of them charges. There's a different level of confidence when you can approach God legally and say, I know what I've done, but God, you wrote a book for me. And when I repent and turn away from my wicked ways, your word says that restoration follows that repentance. And so I'm going to claim what you wrote for me, not what I intended for myself. I'm going to claim what you have for me in the courtroom of heaven because it's mine. And he bought it back for us. He bought it back for us. And see, the biblical word for this legal framework, you know it. It's not a trick answer. It's called a covenant. It's a covenant. The covenant of God has legal representation. It has legal things that we can operate by. A covenant is legal. In in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, he's talking about this covenant that he's making with the people of God. And he made it simple. He said, if you abide by this covenant, here's all the things that you could partake in. Here's the things that you get to enjoy. And if you don't abide by the covenant, then the curses of the enemy are going to overtake you. It's legal. You honor the covenant. This is what happens. You don't. This is what happens. He made it fairly simple. We complicate it. We make it hard. He says, if you do it, it works. If you don't, it won't. It won't. And so this covenant with God that we have is it's official. It's legally binding. And it's not a contract. The difference between a contract and a covenant is that a covenant demands relationship. A covenant demands relationship. I know we got a lot of business owners and people in here that have probably had contracts that have went south. Business partners you thought that were going to honor contracts that didn't. How many of those people y'all still got great relationships with? (laughs) Probably not very much. Because you know, you're like, ah, if they come with me with another contract, absolutely not. But with a covenant, it demands relationship. And then it's amazing because it becomes about the relationship and receiving the things that have promised because of it just happened to be the icing on the cake. It's a byproduct of the relationship that the covenant demanded. And so if you can't litigate properly, in the court of heaven, you're not going to have the authority or the understanding to receive what God has for you. So I don't know about y'all, but we about to be some litigating on the people in here. And we're going to ask God, what do you have in our book? And some of us need to make it a habit every morning and say, God, if you ordained and wrote down everything that was to happen today in a book for me, I want to know what that plan is. I know I plan to do all this stuff. I may be planning to go to that meeting and do that thing. Or what do you plan for me today? And let me be in proximity enough and closeness, closeness enough and nearness enough to you to be able to discern your voice when you're saying, hey, I didn't write that in your book. What are you doing? I didn't write that in your book. Oh, let me step back. God, redirect me. Redirect me. What's the enemy try to keep from happening right now? Redirect me. Where am I going right now? Holy Spirit, redirect me. The word says that you search the mysteries and the depths and the mysterious things of God's will concerning my life and that you invite me to navigate those things with you. Redirect me. What's happening? What's in your book? Stand with me if you would. There are 
<laughs> people, 100 percent people, I'm one of those people. So even if it ain't none of y'all, it's me. But there are people in this room that are waiting and wanting to receive a verdict from heaven pertaining to a ton of things, pertaining to so many different things. We're waiting for a verdict from heaven. And the tension that we find ourselves in is that we know that God's plan for us is a positive verdict, but we just can't seem to get from here to receiving that thing. The unclaimed thing is somewhere in the heavenlies. And for whatever reason, we just haven't crossed and received it yet. And just like in Daniel 10, I said it last time, I'll say it this time again. I feel that the Lord is going to call some of y'all to pray and fast in a way that you haven't done ever, ever. And it's not going to be convenient. It's not going to be fun and exciting. But Daniel fasted for 21 days because that's how long it took for the answer that God sent out on day one to get to him. So are you willing to stay in a posture of starving and depleting your flesh so that you can receive the ruling from heaven in your favor. And obviously, our head tells us, of course, I'm willing to do that. Of course. Try fasting for 40 days when the, 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 the busyness of life is screaming at every corner. And if you're getting accused day and night, you don't think that the moment you decide to do that, the enemy's not going to be like, challenge accepted. Placing bets on you. Hey, I think he's going to stop after three days. I'll give him at least five or six. Show up to court and claim what God's written in your book for you. Claim what he's written in your book for you. Fast. Ask the Lord, like, hey, you're going to ask me to fast? You know what? I'm just, I, I wasn't sure. I think I am. I, God is going to ask somebody in here to fast for 40 days. Y'all looking around like the teacher, like, don't pick on me, please. <laughs> it's like a teacher's trying to pick on somebody, and you're like, oh, don't pick on me. Don't pick. I was going to ask somebody here to fast for 40 days. And it's going to change everything for somebody. It changed everything for me and my family and my house and what God was ultimately calling me to do. It's funny, Pastor Tony gave me a word over a year ago and was, was like, hey, I got this word for you. I'm just going to submit it to you from the Lord. I was like, great, thank you. And I was like, I, I get to get the honor of, of traveling around the world doing ministry stuff. People get me words all the time. And I always submit it to the Lord. And I say, God, is this a word from you? Or is this somebody like hoping that they can be a part of my story? Yeah, I was like, no, that's a word from the Lord. I said, awesome. Insight to my book. That's what I'm talking about. God, where do we start? In the prayer closet. No, 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 God, I don't think you heard the, the word. The word said, the big doors, that ain't, that's a small door. It's like, no, nah, man, that's the door. That is the door that leads to any other thing that I want you to do. Now, for the sake of time, I won't tell the whole story again, but it was on the 40th day that I got the call that I was waiting for. On the 40th day that I looked at my wife in the morning and was like, man, you know what? I don't really feel anything. We were out in Tennessee, just had done some worship event at a college. And I was like, it's all good, though. The, the time I had with the Lord the past 40 days was enough for me. And I'm, I'm good with being in this spot. And we're packing up to go home. I've made in my mind, like, God, the time if, if it was just to get time with you and nearness and closeness with you, that's good enough for me. And I got a phone call that changed everything. How far are you willing to press in with God to receive the things that he's written for you in your book? And he's going to ask you. And unfortunately, some of y'all are going to not do it. And it just is what it is. The busyness of life happens, and you're just not going to do it. And we're going to find ourselves in this position a year from now. But for at least one of you, you're going to take God's invite seriously. And for that person, we can't wait to celebrate with you. So, Father, we just thank you that your word says that 
you have ordained every day of our lives in your book. And we just speak to all of the unclaimed things in the heavenlies that you have for us. God, and we say that we are willing to do whatever it takes to press into your presence as long as it takes to receive those unclaimed things. And when the accuser comes against us day and night, God, we will remember you in your words and we will approach your throne legally and take back everything that he's stolen from us. God, you're the greatest king, the king of kings. You're the greatest judge, and your spirit is the greatest advocate. So we just receive that finished work. We thank you for it, and we celebrate in advance for what it is going to produce in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.